was said, uh, we got back from conference uh, kind of late Saturday night or early Sunday morning. And uh, so uh, we uh, decided not to have service uh, last week. Uh, and then so uh, your pastor hasn't preached in two weeks, so uh, I hope you're ready. <laughs> but we are starting a brand new series beginning here today. And uh, I've uh, been led to name this series only the beginning. And so we're going to be marching through the book of Acts. So if you want to kind of keep up with what the Lord is doing and uh, what's going on, and I want to challenge you to read the book of Acts and study the book of Acts over the, the next few weeks as we're going to be in this series. We'll be in Acts chapter 1, verses uh, 1 through 11 this morning. So just 11 verses. Uh, Nicole said, it's not very long. And I said, it's not many scriptures. It doesn't mean that it's short. <laughs> Well, that's what I was alluding to. Usually the shorter, the longer it is. <laughs> but we'll try to be uh, as expedient and aware of time as we possibly can be. And uh, but before we get started, let's, uh, let's open in prayer and uh, ask the Lord into the service this morning. Father, thank you for all that you placed within my heart as you've allowed us to study and prepare for this series. I ask now that you would allow those words to come forth that you have placed within me, and that they might be your voice that they hear and not mine, that the Spirit would lead and guide us, Lord, to, through this service, and would fill us as well in every way that we need to be filled. We surrender every instrument of our body as an instrument for your righteousness this morning and pray that you would use us to bring honor and glory to your name and that you would unpack your word to each and every one of our hearts. Allow us to see what you want us to see, which means to understand what you want us to understand and help us to be focused upon the fact that it's only the beginning. Today, everybody's looking towards the end, Lord, and thinking that the end is here. And yet it's only the beginning of the kingdom of God. And so we thank you that the kingdom is alive and well inside of each and every one of us. We thank you that through the person of the Holy Spirit, you have brought all of the understanding, all of the oneness, and all of the power of the kingdom into each and every one of our hearts. Teach us to tap into that on a continual basis. Continue us to uh, teach us and help us to learn and understand how to be a vessel that you can work through to accomplish all of these things in our everyday lives. And as always, we'll be careful to give all of the praise, the honor, and glory to you in the wonderful name of Jesus. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. So, the writer of the book of Acts which is the same Luke who wrote the Gospel of Luke. And so he addresses both of them to one particular individual. So we're going to just start off reading in Acts chapter 1, and there it says, The former account that I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach, until the day that he was taken up. And so Theophilus here is uh, a name for someone who obviously is in a high uh, Roman position. Uh, in in uh, Luke it says to the most excellent Theophilus. Uh, here that uh, pretext to the greeting is missing. It just says, O Theophilus. So <laughs> Did Theophilus resign from his office between the writing of the Gospel of Luke or to the writing of the book of Acts? Or did Theophilus just become such a member of the brethren that he no longer needed a title to be put to his name and he just wanted to be known as Theophilus? Either way, whichever one is true, the word Theophilus means a friend of God, a lover of God. So one thing we know for sure, Theophilus, had such a love for God, such a hunger for the Word of God, and such a thirst for the righteousness of God, that God dedicated two of his books to him. 
Wouldn't you like to be that? Wouldn't it be nice if your hunger and your thirst for the things of God was so great that God dedicated two books of the Bible just to your name? Because both of the books of Luke, the Gospel of Luke and now the book of Acts, start off with, O Theophilus, O most excellent Theophilus. So for you and I, hopefully we're all lovers of God. We're all people who hunger and thirst for the things of God. And if we do then the things which he wrote and revealed to Theophilus and to all of the rest of us are just as much for you and I as they were for Theophilus. And it says that Jesus began both to do and to teach. So when Jesus began both to do and teach as he began his earthly ministry at the age of 30, it would only be three and a half years long. But what he began to do was only the beginning of what is going to continue to be done even in our day and time and beyond my day and your day of time. What he began to do is not done yet. He's still doing it. He's just doing it through you and I as his body, his hands and feet, instead of doing it himself. It says until the day that he was taken up, so on the day that he was taken up, something took place. Amen? Amen? So let's look at it together. It says, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Well, we know that what he both began to do and to teach was to tell everyone that the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven had come nigh unto them. And so he continually taught and preached about the kingdom of God and all that the kingdom of God meant. <clears throat> and the kingdom of God was not just the kingdom itself, but eternal life is part of the kingdom of God. That's why, as we learned yesterday as we were studying, that unless you're born again, you cannot see or understand what the kingdom of God actually and truly is. But the kingdom has come into your heart and into my heart with the coming of the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit brought the kingdom into your heart and into my heart. So presently, the kingdom of God abides in every single believer. And the one who's abiding there is the spirit of truth, the spirit of Christ. He is alive and well inside of his temple. And the kingdom of God is alive and well inside of everyone who's been born again and is a part of the kingdom of God. Listen to what he says. Until the day in which he was taken up, and that word taken up there is the same word that's translated caught up or taken up in other places in the Bible, specifically in the First Thessalonians where it says we'll be caught up together with him. The word here is the word rapsizo which in our English means rapture. So as Jesus was walking along with the disciples on this last day that he would remain on earth, there's something to think about, isn't it? What if this, is where, this were your last day on earth? What if this was it? Just last week, I was having a conversation with a lady by the name of Sharon. And I was telling her how well that she looked after going through a period of sickness. The color had returned to her face. Her energy seemed as though it was back. And I was talking to her and telling her that just this past Sunday morning. Because I went to church up to NTC, though I didn't have church here. On Friday, she passed away of a massive heart attack. What if this was your last day on earth? How would you live your last day? Jesus knew it was his last day on earth, and he chose to live it in a very specific way. He chose to live it very intentionally, making sure that the disciples, the apostles, had everything that they needed in order for him to ascend and to hand off the ministry to the twelve apostles. Amen? Or 11, if you want to look at one of them missing. 
But before this, they actually put one other back in his place, right? Matthias was added back in as the 12th, a little bit later in the first chapter of Acts, right? It says that after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering, his passion, or his crucifixion, by many infallible proofs. Now I want you to think about that for a moment. <clears throat> because you see, still today, in the mind of the Jewish people, the lie that they perpetrated after the cross was that the disciples stole the body of Jesus, and that's still the teaching that's prevalent among all of Judaism today. And so for you and I, who are believers in Christianity, we are believing in a lie, according to their line of thinking, because the disciples simply stole the body of Christ. But in order to prove that that lie couldn't possibly be true, Jesus appeared over ten times after his crucifixion, at one time to 500 people at once. In fact, at the time that he had drawn 500 people to himself, one of the questions that was asked was whether or not he would restore the kingdom at this time. And we're going to get to that question here in just a second because the disciples ask it again. But in those 10 times, he gave many undeniable or infallible truths that he was alive and well and in a glorious resurrection body which would no longer know the pain and suffering which he had just went through. Now he was in his glorified state, and he walked with the disciples and the apostles and with over 500 other believers, because only believers saw Christ. No one who didn't believe ever saw him after he was crucified. If you're not a believer, you won't be able to see the risen Christ. For it's only once you've been born again that your eyes can be opened so that you can see the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, and the king who resides as king over that kingdom. Amen? Paul couldn't see him between the time that he was crucified and was raised up out of the grave until on a way to Damascus, he encountered the risen Christ and he saw him for himself and heard him for himself and it changed his life forever. Amen? Amen? Maybe that's you this morning. Maybe you just need to have an encounter with God and that encounter can change your life forever. Amen? Listen to what he says. After he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he has chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, and being seen of them during forty days, speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. See, his teaching didn't change after he rose up out of the grave. For the 40 days they were allowed to see Christ after he rose up out of the grave, his teaching remained the same. He continued to teach the disciples about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, one and the same. And what it took to get there, and what he was empowering them to do to continue the work of the kingdom in his physical absence. Amen? Amen. And so listen to what he says. And being assembled together with them. Don't that just pierce your heart? Being assembled together with them. Later on, the Apostle Paul, who was transformed on the road to Damascus, would say, not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Why did he say that? Because of what it says right here. And being assembled together with them. That means Jesus assembled together with anyone who wanted to assemble with him. And they saw him. 
And they heard him. They communed with the living God as they were assembled together in his presence. Amen. He promises you and I. Wherever two or three are gathered together in his presence, there is he in our midst. Do you realize that you can commune in our communing with the living God right now? You're not waiting for him to come. You can talk to him and hear him talk to you right this second. And he is speaking. I hope and pray that you will hear what he is saying. Amen? Amen. And he says, he commanded them, he commanded them through the Holy Spirit, do not depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, that you have heard from me. Jesus said, hey, I know you're excited. I know seeing me alive. I know seeing the resurrected Christ has lit a fire in you. And I know that you're believing in your heart that you're all ready to do what I've asked you to do. But I'm commanding you to stay where you are in Jerusalem until something takes place. Why did Jesus say that? Why did he just embellish the excitement and the, the overzealousness of the apostles after they've seen him alive for over 40 days? Because for 40 days now they've listened to him continue to teach and they're, they're, they're fired up. I mean, they're ready to get about the business of the kingdom. And Jesus says, but don't go anywhere until you receive the promise of the Father, the thing that I told you about. Now, for somebody who doesn't know the Bible, doesn't know churchy things, which is probably most of the people in the world today, when did Jesus say this? Where did Jesus say this? In John's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 15 through 26, Jesus taught the disciples about the coming of the promise from the Father, the Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of truth, the Counselor, the Helper, all the same person. When He comes, He said, He will lead you into all truth, for He will testify of Me. In other words, He's going to tell you all about Me. The Holy Spirit will be who communes with you about Jesus. And who will also command you, even as I, Jesus, have commanded the apostles through the Holy Spirit. Remember the day, later on in the New Testament, all of the churches gathered together at Antioch. And the Holy Spirit then all of a sudden speaks up and says, Separate unto me Barnabas and Silas and Paul, for I have a mission for them. I'm sending them into all of the world to plant churches. I'm sending them to plant the gospel and plant the kingdom of God in every heart that will receive it. Didn't he say something like that to all of us? In the Great Commission? Didn't he say the same thing? Didn't he say, go ye into all of the world to preach the gospel? Make disciples of all people, teaching them to observe whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Matthew 28. Just as he gave the disciples instructions and commanded them by the Holy Spirit, he has done the same for you and I. If you were down in conference with us, you remember me put it in the analogy that we're going to stand before Daddy one day. And he's going to ask us, why didn't you do what I told you to do? <laughs> I hope I can say I did. With every fiber of energy that you provided through your Holy Spirit for me to do, I did. I hope I hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. 
but only he knows. Amen? What about you? If he was standing here right now, and by the way, he is, would you hear that this morning? Or would you have all of the excuses of why that you didn't find opportunity to do it? He loves us with a perfect love. He'll never condemn us for not doing it. He'll say, I wish you would have. You missed out on living in the kingdom now. You see, most people, most believers are waiting for the kingdom to come. The kingdom's already here. We're not waiting for it as believers. The kingdom is alive and well inside of each and every one of us. Amen. We're not waiting for the kingdom. We're waiting for the physical manifestation of the kingdom, but we're not waiting for the kingdom. It's already here. Amen? The physical manifestation, the millennial reign of Christ is coming. But the kingdom's already here. We're not waiting for it. It's alive and well inside of every believer's heart. Well, it's alive. It's a question of whether it's well sometimes, I think, right? But it is alive in every single one of us. It may be smothered with all kinds of other things, but it is alive, and it can be well. Amen? Amen. Listen to what he goes on to say. After they were assembled together, and he told them to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you've heard from me. And remember what John said? The John who was baptizing with water. The John who was baptizing the baptism of repentance in order to prepare us to receive Christ. He said, I baptize you with water. But there is one who's coming whose shoelaces I'm not even worthy to untie. And he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He will immerse you into the Holy Spirit and immerse the Holy Spirit into you. Isn't that something? That we have been immersed into the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit has been immersed inside of you and I. Whether we realize that, whether we operate in that, doesn't make the difference. The truth is, we've been immersed, baptized in to the Holy Spirit. You know what he's waiting for sometimes? He's just waiting for you to say, I surrender all. I give up all control of my life. You take control, Lord. And when you do, he does. Amen? But as long as you want to be in control, he's a perfect gentleman. He says, go ahead, knock yourself out. When you get tired of being in control of your own life, then you'll let me give you control over that life. Amen? It goes on to say here in verse 7, I think it is. I didn't put my glasses on. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from there. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, You know, if I was the Lord, and I'm not, wouldn't you have thought that probably most of us would have said, That's a stupid question. Didn't I already answer that question once? Didn't I in Matthew 24 and all the rest of the Gospels in the Olivet Discourse, did I not answer that question? But he doesn't say anything like that. In all of his love and all of his compassion, he just simply says, you know what? It's not for you to know the times and the seasons the Father has in his own authority. That's kind of a really nice and polite way of saying you didn't get it the first time, so why would I think you'd get it now? Right? That's, that's 
tough, isn't it? Because sometimes that's exactly what takes place, isn't it? Sounds like we got mic problems there somewhere. Is it this one? Nope, you're good. Okay. I'll put my glasses on so I can see. <clears throat> and he said to them, it's not for you to know the times and seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But, there's always a but with the Lord, isn't there? Yeah, but. Yeah, but. But, you shall receive power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Folks, that's the power behind the Great Commission. That you shall receive power. See, Jesus said, don't leave Jerusalem. I know you're excited. I know you're fired up. And I know you think you can. But the kingdom's work can only be done by the power of the kingdom. So you're to wait until I empower you with that power. And then you're to go. You know what thought I have about that? I think we're still waiting in Jerusalem sometimes. I think we're still waiting for the power. Because it seems like most of the time we're afraid to go. We're afraid of the response. And yet what he said was, after you've received the power, there really isn't much choice. After you've received the power of the kingdom of heaven, there's only one thing you can do with that power. And that's going to tell the whole world about Jesus. Jesus. Without worrying about how they're going to respond, whether they're going to hate you or love you or crucify you or throw you off the side of a cliff or whatever else, you don't really care because you're already part of the kingdom. So they really can't do anything to you anyway, but put you into the kingdom earlier, right? And so you're just going to go and tell them everything that Jesus is commanding you to say. And what he said was, tell them about me. Tell them about the kingdom and tell them how they can get into the kingdom because there's only one way. And by the way, he said, I'm the way. I'm the truth and I'm the life. Tell them about me because I'm the door into the kingdom. They can't enter the kingdom through any other doorway. Oh, they think they can. They believe they can. They even practice that they can. But they're really not in the kingdom. There's all kinds of pretenders and professors out there who aren't actually in the kingdom of God. They want to be. They desire to be. But for some reason, they've never understood the way into the kingdom. And it comes to being born again and being filled with the power of the kingdom and the person of the spirit of the living God. The kingdom, in its present state, will come upon you through the Holy Spirit. The power of the age to come. Matthew 12, 28, and Colossians 1, 13, and this isn't on the board. But Colossians 1, 13 says that we have entered into the kingdom when we have received the power of the kingdom. Hebrews 6 says, for those who have tasted of the powers of the age to come, the kingdom, if they should turn away, there would be no opportunity for them to come back. Because once that you've tasted, once you've sampled, you see, here's what Jesus wants us to understand. When he poured out the Holy Spirit of God upon the church on the day of Pentecost, and pours it out upon each and every one of us as we become believers. What he's saying is, you're getting a sample of, a taste of, 
the age which is to come, the kingdom age. And by the way, the kingdom lasts forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. All the rest of this is just temporary. The everlasting kingdom is already alive and well inside of us. But its manifestation for all of eternity, it awaits. It will manifest itself for a thousand year period of time during the millennial reign of Christ, wherein all of the promises to David and to Abraham and to the nation of Israel will be fulfilled. It will be a visible kingdom. Everyone will see it and know it. That will give way to the new heavens and the new earth or the everlasting kingdom of God in which there will be no more night but only a continual day. Amen? But the kingdom is here. And we can sample that. You ever got a sample of that dessert? One of the places we were in down at conference, I think they gave us a sample of a cheesecake or something. I don't remember. And, man, I wanted some more. <laughs> And the sample wasn't, wasn't enough. You know, I wanted the whole thing, right? And here's what I believe. Once you've sampled the kingdom, the sample's not enough. <laughs> you hunger for more. You thirst for more. And what he promises, blessed are they who hunger and thirst, for they shall be filled. Amen? Amen. But sometimes, uh, no, no, I don't want any dessert. I, I, you know, I don't want any samples. I think we're afraid sometimes if we got a sample, we'd want the rest, right? I think a lot of believers need to get a sample. Don't you? I think a lot of people who claim to be believers need to get a sample of the kingdom to come because they'll never be satisfied ever again with just the sample. Amen? They'll hunger and they'll thirst for the fullness of of the kingdom of God. For he has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Colossians 1.13 says. And then in verse 9. Now when he had spoken these things. While they watched. Isn't that, isn't that just amazing? Jesus is walking along. He knows he's about to ascend. But he wants the disciples to witness it. He wants them to visibly see him ascend in the same glory cloud which the Shekinah glory of God descended down upon the tabernacle in the wilderness and down upon Abram's tent and Moses' tent and throughout all of the rest of the patriarchs throughout history, the glory of God came down. And God was in the glory cloud. And the glory cloud at this moment gathers Jesus up and carries him back to glory where he came from. Amen? When he had spoken these things, they watched as he was taken up in a cloud, a cloud of glory. And it received him out of their sight. He went from being visible to invisible. Just like that. For 40 days, he appeared and disappeared at random. This wasn't a quick event. The glory cloud descended gathered Jesus up, and he stayed visible until he was out of their visible sight. He may no longer be in your or my visible sight, but he's just as present as he's always been. We just don't see him with these eyes. Amen? Amen. And neither did they. He disappeared out of their visible, physical sight. But oh, in about ten days, he returned. And all of the power of the kingdom 
and took up residence inside of them forever. Amen. Isn't that good news? And the kingdom came on that day. Think about it now. Jesus has walked with the disciples for three and a half years. He's taught them for 40 days more after his crucifixion and his resurrection. And the time has come to hand off the work of the kingdom from the Son of God, Jesus Christ, to his body, to his bride, to his church, represented in the apostles. And as he's ascending, he hands off the kingdom to them. Go get them, guys. I got faith in you. I believe in you. Don't worry that you don't know much. I'll teach you everything. I'll give you the power to accomplish everything that I'm asking you to do. Just go. Amen. I think that's what keeps us from stepping out on that command go, right? We're afraid we're not sufficient. We're afraid I don't have enough understanding. I don't have enough knowledge. I don't have enough whatever it is to be able to speak well to other people. I just don't have that, yeah, that gift of gab or that gift of conversation. I'm sure that was the excuse probably of some of the apostles. But one thing they believed, what they didn't have, he would give them with every step that they took. Amen? Amen. Wouldn't it be nice to get back to that simple faith of just believing every step I take, he's empowering me more and more. He's giving me a greater level of understanding. He's giving me a greater ability to perceive and then to be able to share in all of the power of the kingdom of heaven with those who truly need to hear it. Amen? Amen. Oh, they might not receive it. They might reject it. That's not, the, that's not even the issue. The issue is to share. Because some will, even if most won't. Amen? And those some are the ones who still are going to enter into the kingdom. You want to usher in the end? You want to usher in the kingdom age? Go. Because you never know if the one you win is the last one. Amen? And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So the angels bore witness to the truth. They said the glory cloud took him up into heaven. He's coming back on the same glory cloud one day in the future. Don't stand here looking for that day. Get busy about the Father's business while that day is coming. Is what he's saying to those men of Galilee. He told you what to do. Quit standing here looking and thinking that he's coming back any minute. Get busy about the Father's business. Because that is what will cause you to be there and see Him coming on that glory cloud. Amen? Amen. And whether that's soon or it's a hundred years from now, it doesn't really make the difference. What matters is that we be found filled with faith and busy about our Father's business until He does return on that same glory cloud. Amen. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this message this morning. You challenged and you broke my heart with this message and with the rest of this series which is still coming. God, give us ears to hear. Give us feet to apply. And give us, Father, 
all of the power of the kingdom that we truly need in order to be your hands and feet in this dark, lost world. We thank you and we praise you and we yield every instrument of our body as an instrument to obey and for the righteousness of your name and for the honor and glory of your name as well. And all of the saints said, Amen. 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 I'd like to invite everybody to stand up and sing our closing song.
just realize what you have said. Lord, you told, told Thomas that while he was blessed and they were blessed for having seen you in person, how much more blessed those are that have not seen and yet still believed. Lord, we are truly those believers. And we truly ask that you would use the blessing that you have given to us that we would go forth and spread your word as you have called us to do. Lord, we pray that you would keep us safe as we go forth and bring us back when we worship you together once again. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <coughs> Have a wonderful